you know, let me in particular thank uh, Ferdinand and Ronnie for the, for the invitation to come in some sense over the water. Um, actually, well, I've been living and working in Italy in Trieste for the last four years, and it's only this month that I moved to Trinity College Dublin, so in some sense coming home for me. Um, so I'm, things are a bit crazy. But look, this, this, uh, this uh, library is the old library in Trinity College Dublin. It's actually a tourist attraction. I've never been in it. <laughs> but uh, if, you, if, you, if you've been to Dublin in, a, on, on touristic reasons, you, 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 you go there and you also see this Book of Kells, which is a famous book. Yeah, it's a nice picture anyway, right? Um, so yeah, what I want to talk um, about is, is, is about uh, correlations and coherence in uh, work extraction dissipation. Um, <coughs> So I should just say why, why, why I want to try to understand this thing. And I think you know, the advantage of, of being in the latter part of the, the workshop is you try to understand somehow what are issues that maybe in the field we need to discuss a little bit more. And I mean, one thing that's at least clear and very interesting for me from not just a pragmatic point of view, but also from a fundamental point of view. So if you have some you know, engine, a quantum mechanical engine, on a quantum mechanical platform, of course, this is some concatenation of, of operations. They could be uh, unitary operations if you have adiabats, uh, you know, um, uh, dissipative operations if you have isochores. And you know, people are very interested now in, 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 in situations when the working medium is a, is a quantum system. No, but there's no real, say, consensus, at least from my perspective, as to if the quantum, quantum medium is really doing something functional at the level of quantum mechanics. I mean, it is something that still, for me, is not really fully clear. I mean, can you isolate really, not just that the thing is quantum, but really that the quantumness is playing some role in functionality, or perhaps even dysfunctionality, right? Um, so it's a pragmatic and fundamental issue, and I've noticed that in many talks, uh, you know, people, people have sort of, um, sort of uh, uh, debated. So I'm not claiming to, to, to answer the question. Um, but rather, let's say, by motivated by this, this question. So this work, um, well, these two works have been um, basically performed with, um, with some long-term Italian collaborators, um, all from the south of Italy. Mauro, of course, many people know here, he's in the Sicilian colony of Belfast in Northern Ireland. <laughs> the physics department is full of them. And uh, Francesco Plastina from Calabria, and I must say that the, the hero kind of of the, of the, of the story is, is Gianluca Francica, who just finished his PhD and really did a great job on, on some of these things. OK, so, um, so what's the talk about? Again, I, I mentioned just, can you isolate uniquely quantum contribution to physical quantities in thermodynamic protocols, more specifically thermodynamically relevant? OK? So the first part um, I want to consider, and this is very closely to related to Eric's um, talk and the discussion, and I'm happy to break the talk up, and you know, people can discuss some more. I purposely took out some slides. <laughs> um, so if you do some non-equilibrium transformation on the initial thermal state, um, can, you, can you link operationally uh, the coherence of the state somehow to the dissipation that's generated by the unitary? And I, I mean dissipation in a very funny way, which I'll explain, okay? Because it's a unitary transformation I'll talk about. And I'll also, you know, maybe elaborate a little bit on the open system case, okay? The second part of the talk changes uh, um, direction a little bit, and I want to consider something which has been discussed, luckily, by a number of speakers, so Robert Lischke, Gershon Krasitsky, and, uh, and Ram, uh, which is the notion of work extraction from non-passive states, OK? And uh, of course, the, dis the, 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 the disadvantage of speaking in the last part of the thing is that somehow you've heard some of these concepts before, right? So, um, but it, repetition is never bad. And I want to just basically combine the notion of uh, work extraction from non-passive states with the notion of Maxwell demon to try to sort of think about something that I call an ergotropic demon. Okay, um, fine. So where do I begin? Um, first of all, just I, again, it's repetition from Chris Jarzinski's talk, but in this work, statistics business and uh, you know measuring work in a, in, in quantum system, um, we often talk about the two point uh, measurement scheme. Okay. So, you know, it's very simple. Everyone knows it, I think, here. But, like, you have some Hamiltonian with some parameter lambda of t, which you want to vary to different points in the, in, in the parameter space. Now, <clears throat> in the two-point measurement scheme, what you assume is that initially your, 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 your system is in thermal equilibrium um, with a bath, OK? Uh, so it's given, I mean, the state of the system is given by some, 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 some Gibbs state. 
And then you detach the system from the bath and make a projective measurement of the energy. Okay? It's important. And you get, of course, just a probability, which is the Gibbs, fa the Gibbs factor. And then now, of course, the system is projected into the eigenstate, and you do some unitary, which can take you, you know, to lambda f in an arbitrary way. Um, and then you measure the system's energy again. And of course, the, the energy you, you get is with probability, which is a conditional probability conditioned on the outcome of the initial measurement of the energy. Okay? So everybody, everybody kind of accepts that, at least in this protocol, that's the way it, the way it operates. Okay? Now, <clears throat> of course, uh, you know, this, this, this idea that work is not an observable must be described by distribution stems back from a paper that Eric was involved with, with Peter Hange and, and Peter Tautner. And the thing is that you must imagine, you know, preparing the system over and over again in the initial state, running the same protocol many, many times. You get a distribution of these possible energy values, and the, you know, the first moment of the distribution is, is, is the energy change. Now, I remember in, the, in, 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 in Chris Jarzinski's talk that he also said there are some people who are a little bit uncomfortable with this. And I think the uncomfortableness comes from the fact that you know, if you, if you initially start here and you have a diagonal thermal state, you project onto the energy eigenbasis, now you do a unitary evolution, then you build up coherences in the energy eigenbasis, and the second measurement essentially collapses the system again, right? Gets rid of the coherences. Now, what I want to argue is that that's not, I, I'm not uncomfortable with that, right? Because actually, in the end, you know, in the end, and I, I'll, I'll prove this to you, that actually the moments of the work distribution depend on whether they're coherent there or not. So it's actually incorporated there in a funny way. Okay, so the second point that I have to make is that you actually can get work statistics without having to make projective measurements, right? Because you can choose, if you want, not to work with the distribution itself, but rather the characteristic function. And, uh, and essentially, it's quite nice because maybe people which aren't in this business of fluctuation theorems, etc. I mean, this is very closely related to the survival probability that Leah spoke in her talk yesterday. So imagine, rather than doing some unitary evolution, I do you know, a sudden quench, which is something that people in you know, the cold atoms community do a lot, and basically these unitaries, they go away, okay, and you're left with something whose mod squared is basically a survival probability if I start with an initial pure state, okay? So there's some link there. The point is that, you know, it's precisely, I don't want to talk about it in this talk, but I just want to point out that precisely this, this issue of projective measurements, which seems to be hard for experimentalists, was the reason why, you know, a number of years ago we decided to come up with Ramsey interferometric schemes in order for us to actually pluck out the characteristic function and then perform the Fourier transform after a finite time and basically, you know, verify fluctuations here at the quantum level. And this is actually done by the same group in which, you know, the experiment was performed that Eric was talking about. But I don't want to talk about that. I want to get back to this issue of, you know, why coherence is encoded in the, in the moments there and why, in my opinion, there's not such a, such a problem, why it's a useful concept. This is very closely related to what Eric is saying and maybe in a slightly different way and we can debate it, okay? So the first basic thermodynamic transformation, as everyone should know, it's thermodynamics 101, right? I'm doing a reversible isothermal transformation, right? So I'm just basically changing the parameter of the Hamiltonian so slowly that you always remain thermal. You follow the manifold of thermal states. And you say, well, look, what are you telling me this for? I mean, it doesn't matter in the end if you're, if you, why are you talking about quantum mechanics? Strictly speaking, of course, if you want to describe the process which, which takes rho lambda zero to rho lambda f, this is not unitary operation. This is something, you know, non-unitary because you can increase or decrease the entropy depending on how you do it, right? But it doesn't matter because you don't care. You don't care if you're just going between equilibrium states because they're state functions, right? The work done, you can just compute from the free energy difference of these thermal states, right? But the work in general, of course, is not, it's not state function. I mean, if you do a non-equilibrium transformation, so I could basically bring the system now, drive it very quickly, so fast that you're approximately unitary, okay? You end up here at the end with a state sigma, which of course, you know, contains coherences. It's highly non-passive with respect to the final Hamiltonian. And the average work, which is the first moment of the work distribution, is basically just the energy difference because I've assumed the unitary evolution. Now, this is the quantity that was also mentioned in Eric's talk, okay? And another way to think about this, I, I, I don't want to get into this arrow of time de debate or anything, we can talk about it, is that I prefer to call this the dissipated work, right? And it's a bit funny, because nothing's dissipated yet, okay? So, so, so up here, you're basically just after changing the energy from the initial guy to the final guy. Now, what's the assumption here? What, 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 why is this called dissipated work? Well, 
basically, uh, what you can show, and I think this is related to you know a previous paper by, by Eric, and also I found a very similar relation in an old paper by MacDonald, is that what you have to assume is that after you do this really, really strong or brutal uh, unitary driving, then the system basically relaxes in an ideal way back down to the thermal state, which is basically built with the you know, the, 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 the Hamiltonian at parameter point lambda f, okay? And you can prove, basically, that the, the difference between the isothermal um, free energy, standard free energy change, and the work that you do along this unitary drive is basically given by something positive, which is connected to the relative entropy, <coughs> and the, the distinguishability between the state sigma and the state at the thermal state at rho lambda f, even though, I mean, in some sense, uh, uh, and, and you see, the harder I drive, the further these two states, sigma and rho of lambda f, become to each other. Now, why is it called dissipated? What, what's the point in calling that dissipated? It's actually connected in a subtle way to an open systems argument, right? So what you have to consider is that, I mean, it's quite normal to do such process. If you pump your bicycle, I mean, you can do it very fast and you generate excess dissipation and the thing goes back to equilibrium again, okay? So, so essentially, what you can show is that this dissipation is related to the, it's related to the, the thermodynamic entropy change along this process minus the heat given to the bat. Okay? How you see that? Okay, it's just a basic thermodynamic argument. You say, look, the change in energy along the ice, along this uh, along this line, if I'm not, you know, following the manifold of thermal states, is of course given by the sum of these two, you know, path-dependent quantities, which is the work in the heat. Okay. At the same time, you have another, you have another way of writing the, the, this equilibrium energy change, which is basically the free energy, this is just the basic thermodynamic relation, plus T times that less, all equilibrium thermodynamics. And now what you do is you say, well, look, my work, I can show you, is basically the work that I would have done in the reversible isothermal process plus the excess. Okay? Now you just basically put all these guys together, and what you see is that, indeed, the dissipated work is this uh, entropic change minus the heat. So if I, was a if I did a reversible isothermal process, delta S is just equal to the heat, right? That's basic thermodynamics. And so essentially, this is a measure of the dissipation, that the excess dissipation that goes into the bath after you re-thermalize at the end of the unitary process. That's my take on it anyway. I mean, and so it's, in fact, this quantity, this dissipated work, which fulfills the fluctuation theorem. I mean. Is this clear? I mean, yes. okay, good. Now, what's the next point? So, as I was showing you, I didn't prove it, but it's you know, it's 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 very easy. I suggest you read this paper by by Sebastian and Eric because it's it's well explained there and very nicely done. Is that well, the fact that the dissipation, okay, the dissipated work can be written very nicely in terms of uh, in terms of this uh, this relative entropy. Um, it means that maybe we can play some games with respect to some of the results which come from, from quantum information theory. So the relative entropy itself, you know, on its own, is a concept that's used a lot, I mean, especially for people doing resource theories like Jonathan, like Jens, etc., like this. They, you know, it's a ubiquitous quantity, quantum information. Can we do something with it to, to, to make some statement on what would be a quantum mechanical contribution to the, to the dissipated work? And this was mentioned uh, uh, actually by Ram, okay, in a, in a different context, right? So one thing that's qu quite popular now in the quantum information community, I mean, at least as far as I'm concerned, I mean, if I read the papers and try to read the papers, is that along the same lines of what people were doing before with entanglement, people now want to be very careful and try to quantify the coherence, okay? It's another quantity. In some sense, coherence is, is even more fundamental, right? Because in my opinion, anyway. Now, of course, you have to specify a basis, and the idea, and this was you know, better explained by Ram, but anyway, is, is, is basically that you have to define carefully some set of states which, which basically are incoherent, okay? And basically, you want to basically minimize the distance between your state and that set of states which are incoherent, okay? Now, it turns out, okay, that if you can do this minimization, unlike in the entanglement problem, right? And it turns out that the coherence of a state rho and this is kind of obvious, right? Is, is nothing more than basically the change in what I would call diagonal entropy, okay? So essentially, you just take your state uh, and you subtract, sorry, you take your state, you subtract all the off-diagonals, and then basically you subtract the entropy of the state from it, and what's left over, that quantifies the coherence. Now, the point is that it might sound like trivial, but of course, it's the devil's in the detail because, 
I mean, you know, uh, essentially you want to prove that this has all the mathematical properties that you expect of a measure, okay? That's another story. It just quantifies the gradients in the energy basis, right? At the moment, this is completely general, so you, but you have to specify a basis that you're interested in, right? So, 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 so the point is that, you know, you can take this as being a measure of, you know, a coherence in any basis, and it fulfills the proper mathematical properties that you expect of a measure. I mean, perhaps there's more experts here that can... That. No, the point is there, you want to ask, does this contribution enter into the dissipated work, okay? And it does. Uh, and so it's, it's related, again, so now you have to specify the basis. The basis of relevance for thermodynamics, the energy eigenbasis. So first of all, you basically think about, you can think about the instantaneous energy eigenbasis, the Hamiltonian along the parameter. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's, 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 it's pretty obvious what that is. And now you define the phase state in that basis, okay? And this is the diagonal ensemble. I think, uh, you know, Anatoly Polkovnikov wrote many papers about thermodynamics with diagonal entropy, etc. It's interesting enough because this is the same type of state you would get if you did, uh, you know, a time average, right, of a, of a dynamics. But in any case, that's what you do. You define the phase state. And what you see, basically, is that the coherence in the, the relative entropy of coherence in this particular context is nothing more than the, the change in diagonal entropy. Now, what do we do? We prove in the paper that this dissipated work, interestingly enough, or maybe it's obvious to some people, can be separated out into two terms, okay? One term, which is exactly the, the change in diagonal entropy, or if you want, from the quantum information theory perspective, it's the, really the quantifier of the coherence built in the energy eigenbasis, whereas the other term is another relative entropy related to the change in populations of the state, so the diagonal part, okay? So this is the, the distance between the, diag the diagonal ensemble and the state at the end of the protocol, okay? And that's, that's essentially the, one, of the, one of the results. Um, now, interestingly, and I, I, I don't know, I haven't seen this before, I'm, I'm not sure what to make of it, but maybe somebody has some idea, is that you can define some stochastic variables in exactly this problem, okay? So the first one is the stochastic variable that you would measure to measure dissipated work, okay? But you can also define new stochastic variables, this PNM, CNM, and if you assume some they're distributed according to some distribution like this, what you see is basically the average of these stochastic variables. The average of the S is the beta times the dissipated work. The average of P is this relative entropy term related to the diagonal part of the dynamics. And the average of this stochastic variable C is the coherence of sigma. And all of these actually fulfill fluctuation theorems. Okay? I don't know if it's good for anything, but it's somehow just an observation that I want to make. Okay, so dissipated work, okay, in general, as I said, is forgetting about whether you call it dissipated work or reversible work, essentially what you're dealing with there is just the energetic deviation from an ideal reversible process, okay? And it may be the case that you're not interested in that, right? Maybe you have an adiabat, and uh, like in Adolfo's, in, in, in the auto engine, maybe it's not an isotherm, you're not interested in the deviation from an ideal you know, isothermal process, but rather the deviation from an ideal adiabatic process. Now, the point is that adiabatic processes are unitary always, right? But, a, but an isothermal process is not unitary, okay? So what's quite nice here is that, uh, is that uh, you can assume, you know, you can assume um, the adiabatic transform, which, which is a unitary, and basically you can do some, you can come up with some measure, cook up some measure of non-adiabaticity again, which is directly related to the change in Diagonal entropy, this row of tau is the same as sigma. Sorry, I've changed the notation a bit. The point is that you can do an adiabatic expansion of the unitary in powers of the inverse time, and so if it's not, if it's not quite adiabatic, and what you see is exactly that the non-adiabaticity is the coherence of the state, okay? I think this is along the lines of, 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 of Paul Kovnikov's work. Now the question is, okay, it's all well and good, but this uh, entropy production, dissipated work thing you've kind of cooked up from kind of, you know, brutalizing a unitary process by connecting it to the bath at the end. And the question is, does the division, you know, still hold for, a, for, for, for an open system? And actually, this is in another paper, it's a very nice paper by, by Mauro, which was basically on the archive around the same time as us. The point is that if you assume a Lindblad master equation, okay, with a thermal fixed point, okay, that's important. So it must be of the so-called Davies type, this master equation, right, which basically takes any state and brings it down to a thermal state. The, 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 the entry production can, you know, traditionally people do this, especially in stochastic thermodynamics. They try to basically, you know, separate out a contribution, one contribution, which is basically the internal entry production rate. So what the system is producing, basically, 
it's the irreversible component, and a, a flux, okay, meaning this would be just like the entropy that's going from the system into the path. The same division can be performed at the level of the, of the internal entropy production rate. So what you get if you do the calculation is basically you find that you can separate again the, uh, the, inter the internal entropy production into a term which is precisely the, 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 the rate of entropy production that's well known uh, for classical Markov processes, Pauli master equations. Okay? So, and the other term which is the rate again of the generation of coherence in the energy eigenbasis. <laughs> So, so, so the point is that you might say, well, so what? I mean, so what about this division? But I think, you know, it's nice because if you have machines that are operating out of equilibrium and you want to say what is the influence of coherence in the energy eigenbasis to their functionality, then we know that entropy production plays a role. So we can start thinking, you know, precisely about this question, not definitively, but at least precisely about it. I mean, okay. So, just one, yeah. in this equation, we mean H is time dependent. It, it, it can, it, well, I, I've assumed the time independent one, does it hold for a time dependent one? I wouldn't see why not, but you'd have to be careful, I guess, that your, your, your driving doesn't compromise the, you know, the approximations that you've made to derive the equation in the first place. But I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, it, it's, it's not this particular result is not mine. We have another open system calculation in the paper now, but it, um, yeah, I, I think it could be. I don't think it's really. really necessary that you're time independent. So just a summary of this part of the talk is just, look, there's a coherent contribution uh, to generic unitary driving of a system which can be isolated and studied in a thermodynamic way, okay? This is thanks to relative entropy of coherence. Some division can be made for the blood master equation. And in my opinion, you know, it's a nice thing, at least if you're interested in the role of coherence in some engine cycle, because, you know, in the end, your, com your cycle is comprised of uh, such transformations. Okay, the second part begins at Queen's University Belfast. I'm not sure if many of you have been there. Maybe there was a, one of the cost network meetings on thermodynamics was there. But uh, if you go around the, the, the side of the, the university, you find, a, you find a statue of this guy. So you probably know him as Kelvin. As an Irishman, I know him as William Thompson because I don't call him a lord. But uh, anyway, the, po <laughs> the point is that uh, what, what, what he, he had, of course, he was born in Belfast, but the Scottish claim him because he left like one year you know, after. And this notion of, uh, of, of, of passivity, essentially, um, you know, in some sense is the quantum mechanical version, I would, I would say, of the William Thompson statement of the second law which doesn't actually invoke the concept of entropy, which is, which is quite nice. So the idea is that no work can be extracted from a closed equilibrium system during a cyclical variation of the parameter by an external source. And I'm sorry if there's some repetition with, with, with the other thoughts, but this notion of passivity is very simple. You have some Hamiltonian and you have some, um, you have some state rho s. And unlike the first part of the talk, I'm, no long, I'm, I mean, I'm now restricting myself to cyclical variations of the Hamiltonian as opposed to driving it between two points in parameter space. The state is passive with respect to Hamiltonian if uh, it commutes with the Hamiltonian, and also if the populations of the state are strictly decreasing as the energies increase. That's the definition. Okay? Um, the nice thing is, and which was pointed out by, by Robert Liske, is that this is well known to the, in the mathematical physics community. I also point out that Fabio Benatti told me it's also in the book by Thiering, so the old mathematical physics book. Um, but the nice thing is that, now imagine I do, a cons I do a cyclical drive on a quantum system. Okay, so I turn on some V of t for some time interval. So I turn it on and off. So the work done or extracted using this convention basically is given by this. So the sigma of tau is just the, the evolved density matrix under the unitary. And essentially, you know that passive states, you can prove you can prove that you cannot extract any work from them. You can only do work in them. Okay? So it's, it's quite nice, I mean, uh, concept. Furthermore, there's a very, very beautiful proof, and I think this was mentioned, is that there's a notion of complete passivity, which is basically a state is completely passive with respect to Hamiltonian if and only if it is passive and if n copies of the state are passive. And the unique, the unique state that's completely passive is the Gibbs state. It's not trivial, I mean, uh, but okay, it's, 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 it's a nice result. So that's, 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 that's this thing. Now, what's important for me is that uh, um, is, is this notion of ergotropy, and it was mentioned in a number of talks. And of course, the point is that is now if you're given a non-passive state, okay, you can extract work from it. And the very, very nice uh, work by Lerve Vedian already many years before, you know, many people started studying quantum thermodynamics um, in this way, 
is that you can always figure out, you know, what the unitary is such that you get the maximum amount of work out, right? And it's, it was mentioned in other talks, there's essentially the unitary that makes the state passive at the same entropy as the initial state. Now, I want, what I want to do now is I basically, and this is, you know, the, 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 the closed form expression where I consider basically the, um, the decomposition of the density matrix and the, and the Hamiltonians. It's nice you can play games with that. Here, RJ are the, the arbitrary basis, EK is the, the Hamiltonian eigenbasis. Now, what do I want to do? Um, well, first of all, just some examples, okay? So you can just imagine you have some trivial Hamiltonian like one, some state like this, and you can compute the ergotropy, it's just a half in the state. If I take a state like this, which is a mixed state, then I basically bring a unitary to bring it down here, and basically I get this guy, and I get out one third work. So you can start playing these simple games. No, nothing deep about that. But getting back to Kelvin, now I want to combine this with the notion of uh, a Maxwell demon. And a Maxwell demon, of course, you know, is but Maxwell's idea, but it was Kelvin that christened that idea. Okay. And uh, connected again to Eric's talk, also Kelvin talk, spoke a lot about reversing error of time. There's an absolutely beautiful paper in Nature in 1874 where Kelvin considers reversing the, 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 the direction of time. And it's very kind of poetic where he starts saying, you know, boulders would recover from the mud and materials are quite to reveal them from their jagged forms and all sorts of stuff. And then in the footnote, you'll see basically him defining a Maxwell demon, right? So he says that the demon is an intelligent being endowed with free will and fine enough tactile and perceptive organization to give him the faculty of observing and influencing individual molecules of matter. So, Kel so, so Kelvin sort of, he, he christened the idea and he kind of had an idea that it was related to irreversibility and these things. Actually, I just want to share this since the last day of the conference, but I printed out this for a bunch of students recently, and I had to go back to the original paper, which is really, really well written, and I recommend people, but there's a beauty in it. It's actually the, 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 the article before Kelvin's article, uh, if, you, if, you, if you read the original thing, it's a proof to me that somehow, even back in those days, people were selling nonsense to journals, right? So if you, <laughs> if you look at this, right, look at this by another Irish guy. <laughs> A beech pierced by a thorn plant. On the road from this to Belfast, there is a thorn hedge with beech trees at intervals, and thorn plants have grown right through the middle of the trunks of the two beeches. I do not know whether this is sufficiently uncommon to be worth mentioning in nature. <laughs> so there you go, guys. <laughs> anyway, so, so let's move on. So the, the, point is the, the point is that I want to combine the notion of ergotropy with, uh, with demonology. Okay? So what, what's the idea? The point is now I get some, uh, I get some, uh, I have some system and ancilla, okay? And imagine I'm trying to extract work from the system and I don't know about the ancilla. And I bring in a demon, okay? And the demon makes an, a measurement of the ancilla, okay? Some projective measurement. And he gets some, some, some results and what happens is basically that the, the, the new system state is conditioned on the, on the measurements that the, that the demon makes, okay? So it's some, some conditioned state. And then he does some unitary, and he can extract some work, okay? And, uh, and, and basically, now what he does is he runs the protocol over and over again, and you get some expression, which is basically um, uh, averaged over the outcomes uh, condition on the projective measurement that the demon makes. Plenty of people have discussed this. I, I'm not citing them, but you know, it's, it's kind of normal. Well, like, what we did was basically, we said, now imagine you have a, a type of, you know, additionally clever demon, which not just implements a, 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 you know, a standard unitary to get out work, but he, he uses the ergotropic one. He somehow knows that whatever the, 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 the condition state is, he knows what unitary to apply to get the maximum out. Okay? And uh, we just call this demonic ergotropy. We're just having um, a bit of fun with it. The point is that um, uh, you see that you know, he's, he's applied now the U of A condition, I mean, depending on what the post-measurement state was, he's applied the optimum, and you get a quantity like this. You can see very easily that this must be positive, so by knowing something, I mean, you essentially always get more. But what's quite nice is that if you maximize this expression over all projective measurements, so the quantum information people already probably know that this is equivalent to P of M, and it'd be correct, okay? Um, but let's say you maximize this quantity over all possible um, projective measurements, you get this thing, okay? And basically, we call it a gain. This is quite similar to the notion of deficit, which has been discussed a lot in quantum information. And you can see that basically, if you take just pure states, you can prove that if you have, you know, if the system and still prepared in a product state, then you know that basically you cannot gain with this demonic protocol. 
I think that's a bit trivial because you know you'd expect that. It's much more uh, it's much more complicated when you deal with um, uh, mixed states. Okay, so in mixed states, sort of the notion of entanglement and correlations becomes much more complicated. Um, so we're going to focus on uh, concurrence as a measure of uh, two qubit entanglement. So what's this plot? So unfortunately, we weren't be able to do uh, weren't able to do strict analytics in this particular case because already with two qubits it becomes very 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 difficult. So what does it mean? So you, you'll see first, basically, this is the concurrence of the states. You've got thousands of randomly drawn states, two qubit states here. And basically, this is, uh, is, the, is the gain that you get. And now you see something already, you know, which is depressing, not depressing, but let's say you see, look, you can find, you can find two qubit states, okay, which have basically no entanglement, but they have arbitrarily high gain, okay? Nevertheless, you can identify st classes of states which give you always the, 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 the maximal amount of, of gain. And in addition, if you give me a state with fixed concurrence, I can always give you a lower bound, and that lower bound is a monotonically decreasing function. So that's, what, that's basically the, 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 the finding there. So there are states with no entanglement, which give maximal gain in this game. Maybe it's interesting, in my opinion, it could be interesting because it's a two qubit problem to look at such, such a thing in an iron trap, something like this, where you use somehow the additional energy gain as a maybe a kind of witness of the correlations in the state given that you know the you know this plane um, but that's 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 about as much as we could do maybe maybe someone else can do better anyway uh, so in summary I mean we just had this thing of coherence and non-equilibrium transformations and uh, and you know the role of correlations in work extraction from non-passive states just some selfless advertising I moved here and I'll start a new group basically I have some positions available and if you have students or something that are maybe interesting working in sort of interface with thermodynamics and many-body physics, I mean, I'm happy to talk to them. So thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for the nice talk. So, are there questions? Yep. So, uh, if I want to evaluate quantum efficiency, that is the rate at which you can extract heat rather than the total amount of heat that you can extract, and I want to do this uh, not only for two qubits, but you know, for more advanced systems. Uh, what do you suggest? I, 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 I think I missed the, 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 the can, can you repeat just one, one more time? Sorry, I missed the main point. The, the rate at which I extract the heat rather than the total amount of heat I can extract, which is related to the quantum efficiency mm -hmm. because of quantum fluctuations or whatever. Mm -hmm. I didn't really talk about the issue of heating as such, but I guess you can probably apply, if you have some, some energy conservation, you can probably you know, equally talk about the work, right? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the point is that when you do, like, like it's been talked about many times in, in, in the workshop, um, you know, if you do things very quickly, I mean, you can often, being quantum mechanical there, in my opinion, can often be bad unless you can you have some way of utilizing the coherence there. So you can it actually, having coherence there can be bad if you don't have a way to use it. So it very much depends on what you have, in my opinion. Yeah. So, and what, what, what operation you're allowed to do. Yeah. Yep. I have a small, uh, um, I played a bit with, you mentioned in the mm. fact that if you have um, non antibiotic effects, it's coherent, but in principle you can exploit them. And uh, so it's not exactly like a counter uh, Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think this issue is something, yeah, I mean, uh, I always want, like, depending on who you talk to, <laughs> it's like uh, either the state at the end of some driving protocol has got a lot of free energy in it, or that's wasted because you can't access it anyway. So this is something, I guess, that depends on very much on what people can do. Because in principle, like, you can use that excess energy to, to do something, but often you just assume that it's gone. And it's off. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So okay, so I I, I see the I see. You the never said this, but somehow people should be using non-diagonal. No, I mean I think it's less about I didn't I didn't claim I didn't claim I didn't claim I had a definitive answer to that. I'm just saying that you know I don't know of other examples where I can generate coherence as an eigenbasis if I throw a stone out the window. I mean I, I don't I don't fully understand your point in that, and that's maybe we can discuss it after. But I don't I don't see it's it's. Yeah, I mean, uh, maybe it's to do with like uh, you kind of frame this issue. I, I, I don't know. Maybe you're getting at this change of reference frame as a resource or something like this. But uh, I'd like to discuss it. I don't fully understand the point. So. Yeah, yeah.